Good morning, everyone. It's uh, a joy and pleasure to be with you, like always. We're going to be back into uh, the book of Acts, continuing our series there. As we've gone through Acts, we've seen that um, the young church, Christ church, is being established, and uh, he has sent the Spirit to indwell in the church at Pentecost, and then that church is now going out and expanding uh, from Judea, from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria, and we've been hearing some things that happen in and around Samaria for a few weeks now, and now in Acts, we have this transition point where the Apostle Peter comes back onto the scene, and as, uh, as Peter comes back onto the, to the scene, we see him uh, in his ministry in our passage today, and then we spend a few other chapters in the next, uh, we'll call it transition or expansion of the gospel. And so as we read Acts 9, verses 32 through 43 this morning, um, I'm not sure if we got it on the screen or not, but we don't have it on the screen? Okay. Thanks, Steve. So uh, you'll see there, in they're probably in every other seat, there's a blue Bible. So if you, um, if you look in front of you, if you don't have a Bible with you, you can open to uh, the book of Acts, Acts chapter 9. Um, Acts is in the New Testament. We do this at youth group all the time because uh, sometimes it's hard to find where the books are and stuff, and then everybody feels super uncomfortable and like, oh, I don't, I don't belong here because I don't know where the books are. Well, nowadays, especially young people, they only use the Bible and your phone, so you don't really have to know where books are. But Acts is in the New Testament, which means it's in the second half, at, right after Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. Ah, look at there. Well, now you get it double. You got a Bible in your hand and a Bible up front. Now everybody knows what we're reading, for sure. So Acts 9, 32 through 43. This is God's word. God speaks to us through his word. Let's turn our ears to it now. Now as Peter went here and there among them all, he came down also to the saints who lived at Lydda. There he found a man named Aeneas, bedridden for eight years, who was paralyzed. And Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. Rise and make your bed. And immediately he rose, and all the residents of Lydda and Sharon saw him, and they turned to the Lord. Now there was in Joppa a disciple named Tabitha, which translated means Dorcas. She was full of good works and acts of charity. In those days she became ill and died. And when they had washed her, they laid her in an upper room. Since Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples, hearing that Peter was there, sent two men to him, urging him, please come to us without delay. So Peter rose and went with them. And when he arrived, they took him to the upper room. All the widows stood beside him, weeping and showing tunics and other garments that Dorcas had made while she was with them. But Peter put them all outside and knelt down and prayed. And turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes. And when she saw Peter, she sat up. And he gave her his hand and raised her up. Then calling the saints and widows, he presented her alive. And it became known throughout all Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. And he stayed in Joppa for many days with one Simon, a tanner. Grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our Lord abides forever. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we come to you, our God, our rock and our redeemer, And we acknowledge, Lord, that at times we feel that you aren't present. We feel that we are lost and alone. We feel that we've lost sight of you. But we know, Lord, that you promise to speak to us and to feed us and to commune with us through your word. So we pray, let that word come to us now. Through that word and by your spirit, heal us and we will be healed. Lord, save us and we will be saved. Do a work in us this morning. And as you do, we will praise your son for the hope that you give us in him. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. The best is yet to come. That little phrase became sort of an unofficial slogan of a mostly non-denominational church movement in like the 2000s, 2010s. Basically, my understanding at least is that there was this group of pastors, most of them were like really 
successful mega churches, and they would all go to these uh, conferences together and kind of copy each other's ideas, learn from each other, and take them back to their churches, which sounds a little bit like a denomination to me, but hey, Nobody asked me. It doesn't matter. <laughs> but there's actually a church near here, if you go down 22, on their sign, it's there every day. The best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. It was also, this is a little bit of a side point, but me and Jillian both grew up in Anderson, South Carolina, and there was a church that I lived literally across the street from, massive church. That was there. They said it all the time. The best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. So literally here, 22 and where I grew up in South Carolina, the same thing. Best is yet to come. Well, my question is, is that actually true? Do you have any reason to hope that the best is actually yet to come? My answer to that is no. No, you do not. You have no logical reason to hope for better things. Why would you? I'm okay, think about it like this. Um, every generation, it seems like, you know, every generation that comes up, we got to make the world a better place. We got to make the world a better place. At least as far as I know, every generation has said that. And when is the last time you heard somebody saying, man, you know what? I am really pleased with the state of the world right now. <laughs> so what makes us think the best is yet to come? <laughs> or for like, you could, you know, you say, well, that's society. But me personally, the best is yet to come for me. Okay, maybe. I've got an uncle who calls it breaking the cycle of poverty, where you're like, my family has been poor and unstable for generations, and I'm going to break the cycle of poverty in my family. I'm going to be successful. I'm going to be happy. And you might, but you could also be in an accident and be disabled for the rest of your life, and that's totally out of your control. So what real reason do you have to hope the best is yet to come? You don't. You just make yourself believe that because it makes life easier to believe things are going to get better for me. Things are going to get better for us. You have to create this sort of lie. It's a helpful lie, but it's a lie nonetheless in your head that makes life more bearable. You have no reason to believe that the yet best is yet to come. So that's it. Sermon over. Let's go home. <laughs> No, I'm just joking. Everybody knows this is the introduction. <laughs> All that is true, though, unless there is a real hope, unless there is something that you can hang your hat on, so to speak, to say better things can and will come. And that hope is only found in Jesus Christ. It is only found in Christ. And that's what this passage is telling us this morning. God is showing us here is real hope. Here's how it's offered to you in Christ. Now repent and believe the good news of this hope. And so there's three ways that God shows us, offers us really. There's three ways that God offers us hope in this passage. And the first is God offers hope that Christ can heal you. Hope that Christ can heal you. Let's look at verse 32. Now as Peter went here and there among them all, he came down also to the saints who lived at Lydda. There he found a man named Aeneas, bedridden for eight years, who was paralyzed. Most scholars think that this Aeneas either had a stroke or he was in an accident that left him paralyzed for eight years. So, I mean, this is real life that we're reading about. Eight years, he's been helpless, stuck, and confined, paralyzed. Peter comes across Aeneas. Look at verse 34. Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. Rise and make your bed. And immediately he rose. And notice how this has happened. We're like, okay, Peter is going around to the different places. This passage is about Peter. Peter does a healing. Peter does a miracle. Well, according to Peter, who heals? Jesus Christ heals you. Jesus is the one who is still living and active and working in our world through the apostle Peter. And that's actually really important and really comforting at the same time. Because Peter, as an apostle, has been commissioned by Jesus, this is back in the Gospels, to go out and do these healings and do these resurrections, as we'll see later on. But we don't have those same sort of apostolic healers coming around to our churches. At least one has never showed up at MCC that I know of. But 
that doesn't mean we don't have hope that you can be healed. Because it wasn't Peter who had the power to do the healing anyways. It was Jesus. And Jesus can still heal today. It's actually emphasized by God in the text. So uh, Luke, who wrote the Gospel of Luke and also wrote Acts, same guy wrote them both. And he has this thing where he likes to put the word, the Greek word for Jesus and the Greek word for healing or healer right beside each other because they sound the same. So it's like Jesus and Yetai. Jesus heals, Jesus heals, Jesus heals. Jesus can heal you. So the other day, we uh, have a church league softball team that we're uh, that we have. There's a bunch of people from other churches and stuff too. But um, so uh, you also know. I mean, if you're here a few months ago, you saw me hobbling around on my crutches because I sprained my ankle and uh, all that stuff. So they, the softball team was really nice, and they let me come out. And I couldn't run yet, but they would let me hit. Uh, so I'll just hit and stand there, and somebody else would have to run for me because I couldn't run, uh, which was fun for me. But um, Anyways, we I did that in one of these games, and a few people here were banged up, and the other team knew that I was hurt, and um, so some people from the other team were like, hey, can we pray for y'all's injuries? So I'm like, I mean, sure, why not? The pastor's not supposed to turn down prayer, I guess. We should probably, you know, okay, fine. So they, like, circle around me and these couple other guys, and all of a sudden, they started, like, praying, praying. I mean, it was... Lord Jesus, we know that you are powerful. We know that you can do anything. We know that by your wounds we are healed. So heal his ankle right now, Lord, if it be your will. Even in this moment, heal his ankle. And I thought, whoa, these dudes are legit. Like, they actually have hope that Jesus can do something. This is awesome. And then right after that, I was super convicted. At the same time, I thought, here I was, the quote-unquote pastor. And I'm like, God. Do we really have to do this right now? There's not really any point. Jesus, you know, nothing's really going to happen. That's what was going through my mind. It's not hope that Christ can heal, but Christ can heal. And I will say, okay, my ankle wasn't healed on the spot, but it did get way better, way faster. It was spanning the next two weeks. So I don't know. Take that for what you will. This is what James 5, 14 through 16 says. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it's working. That offers you hope that Jesus really can heal, even in this life. Turn to him, and that hope is yours. But not only that, God also offers you hope that Christ will heal you. Not only that Christ can heal you, but point number two is that Christ will heal you. So let's look at this next um, miracle that happens. So look at verse 36. There was in Joppa a disciple named Tabitha, which translated means Dorcas. She was full of good works and acts of charity. So this is Tabitha. She's a great, she's a saint. She's doing good works. It appears in the passage. She takes care of a lot of these widows who are in need. She became ill and died, verse 37. And when they had washed her, they laid her in an upper room. So now she has gotten sick and passed away. And so they, in verse 38, Lida, Lida, excuse me, was near Joppa, where Peter was. The disciples, hearing that Peter was there, sent two men to him, urging him, please come to us without delay. This is similar to like Jesus and Lazarus. When uh, Lazarus, who is Jesus' friend, Mary and Martha's brother, Lazarus is sick, and they call over to Jesus. Jesus, come save Lazarus before he dies. Similar sort of thing going on. And so here what happens is Peter does come. And verse 40, look at verse 40. This is where Peter shows up. He put them all outside and knelt down and prayed. And turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes. And when she saw Peter, she sat up. And he gave her his hand and raised her up. And then calling the saints and widows, he presented her alive. There's a lot of things we could say about this miracle. It's a resurrection miracle, which is just amazing in and of itself. But at the most fundamental level, 
this miracle is here because it gives us resurrection hope. Resurrection hope. Now I'm going to go on to explain what I mean by that. It means that Tabitha's resurrection is kind of like a picture that should give you hope of the possibility or even guarantee of resurrection for you yourself. In other words, what happens to Tabitha can be true of you. So I'm going to explain that. And then we're going to circle back and talk about what that means for right here, right now, for me and you. So stay with me. When we, we're going to do some work to understand this idea of resurrection, and then there'll be a big payoff at the end. So look at verse 41. I want to point something out there. In verse 41, Peter gave her his hand and raised her up, and then calling the saints and widows, it says he presented her alive. He presented her alive alive. Now, in the book of Acts, that's really interesting, because if you go back to the very beginning of Acts, in Acts chapter 1, listen to these words for how Luke is writing, how Luke describes Jesus. In the first book, O Theophilus, this is at Luke's introduction, I've dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach, implicitly saying that now in Acts, he's continuing to do and teach. Verse 2, until the day when he was taken up, after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. Verse 3, listen to this. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs. In other words, when Jesus was resurrected, he presented himself alive to the disciples. And now, Peter, one of these disciples, is presenting Tabitha alive to the saints and disciples at Joppa. Tabitha's resurrection is talked about just like Jesus' resurrection. And we have this sort of like gut reaction that, wait a minute, surely there's something special about Jesus' resurrection. Like Tabitha didn't die for anybody's sins. Tabitha didn't save anyone. And those things are true. But Tabitha did have faith in Jesus Christ. And through faith in Jesus Christ, Tabitha is united to Christ. Just like me, you, and anybody else anywhere who believes in the Lord Jesus Christ. Which means... By faith, you are connected to Jesus. You are with Jesus. We talked about this a few weeks ago. Romans 6, 5 explains it like this. If we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Or Colossians 2, 12, you've been buried with Christ in baptism, in which you were also raised with Christ through faith. 2 Timothy 2, 11, if you have died with him, you will also live with him. That resurrection life that Christ lived and died to earn by his perfectly righteous life through faith is given to you. You are given resurrection life, Christ's resurrection life as a free gift. It's offered to you by faith already now so that if Ephesians 2 says you are spiritually dead in your trespasses and sins, you're dead in your trespasses and sins. Well, how do I come out of my sins? You got to be made alive in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what he offers you through his life and death and resurrection in union with Christ. You can be made alive with Christ already now. So there is a sense in which you already participate in that resurrection life, even right now. But it's also true that that has implications for your future or a resurrection hope for the future. What's to come, Paul speaks about in Romans 8, 11, 8, 8, 11, excuse me. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So the Holy Spirit, Jesus had a real physical body on earth. The Holy Spirit, the Bible says, brought raised Jesus up, brought him back to life with a real second glorified resurrection physical body. When you come to faith in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit sent by Christ comes to dwell in you. And what's that spirit going to do in you? He's going to also raise you up on the last day to give life to your mortal body so that after you have died and Christ returns, you will have a new perfected resurrection second body just like Christ. Our body will be changed 1 Corinthians 15 talks about. It'll be renewed, restored, perfected. The perishable body will put on the imperishable. This mortal body will put on immortality. 
you will be glorified with Christ and in Christ forever. I know we did a lot of work right there, and I'm just spitting stuff at you. (laughs) But here's the payoff. If you put your faith in Jesus Christ, one day everything that's wrong with you will be healed. It will be healed. All of your emotional, mental, psychological challenges, problems, issues, whatever they are, they will be healed. All of your physical ailments, your weaknesses, every part of your body that's deteriorating or falling apart or distorted, it will be healed because you will be raised up with Christ on the last day. That's your resurrection hope. You can know that for a fact. It's true because you've been, res- you've been united to Christ. And if he lives with a second resurrected body, you will live with the second resurrected body. I've struggled at times in my life, as you can tell from our first example, <laughs> from with praying for healing. And I don't know if this is something you've experienced, but you have those times where you either you or someone you, you see, know, love, is suffering just like horrible, awful suffering. And so you pray, Lord, heal, Lord, heal, Lord, heal, Lord, heal, Lord, heal, Lord, heal, and nothing changes. And eventually your heart just gets calloused and hard. And I've gotten to the point at at one time in my life where I said, okay, Lord, if you won't heal, I'm not asking. I'm done with that. But I was wrong in those thoughts. It's wrong to think that because in those times when I say I'm done asking for healing, that is forgetting our resurrection hope. That's forgetting the fact that if you are in Christ and you are praying in Christ, then it's not, number one, we already said, it's not that God can't heal you, but it's also not that God won't heal you because he will. If you are in Christ, he will. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things will have passed away. The time of the resurrection, the new heavens and the new earth, those things will be gone. All those things that you prayed to be healed, if you are in Christ, they will be healed. That is the reality of our hope. So no matter how messed up you think you are, you are not broken beyond repair because Christ will make you new. Or no matter what you've been through, no matter what's been done to you, you're not too far gone. You may feel like, oh, I'm damaged goods. There's no coming back from this. But you won't feel that way forever because if you know Christ, Christ will Heal you, period. He will heal you because he will raise you up with him on the last day. That is a resurrection hope that's being offered to you by God today, right now. And to receive that, you believe it in faith. You turn to Jesus and say, Lord, you are my savior and king. I believe. Help my unbelief even. It is a reality in light of this. Christ will heal you. That at times in your life, I don't know where you are, but it, it, it can be hard to hear that because you could be at a spot in your life where like, okay, great. That is hopeful somewhat that Christ will heal me. It is. But also I'm miserable right now. My life is awful right now. And then you put point number one on top of it where you're like, Christ can heal you. And you say, well, he's not. He can, but he hasn't. So now what am I supposed to do? Where does that, where does that leave us in those moments? It leaves us with this. And I'm not saying this is going to answer all your questions and 
you know, your heart's going to be immediately satisfied because, you know, in the next five seconds. But these things are true. This leaves us to rest in the hope that Christ will redeem your hurt. Number three is rest in the hope that Christ will redeem your hurt. You know, both Aeneas and Tabitha, they were real people who really suffered. We kind of separate them from reality. Um, They suffered, and then the people around them, too, also suffered because they were suffering, and yet their suffering wasn't meaningless. And your suffering isn't meaningless either. When Aeneas is healed, he rises, he makes his bed, and this happens in verse 35. All the residents of Lydda and Sharon saw him, and they turned to the Lord. Because of his suffering and eventual healing, many turned to the Lord. God is glorified. A great, a good came out of his suffering. And the same for Tabitha. She's raised from the dead. Peter presents her, remember, to the saints and widows, and then this happens in verse 42. It became known throughout all Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. Because she got so sick that she actually died, many believed in the Lord. God was glorified in her suffering. God will be glorified in your suffering, even in your death, if it comes to that. And God will be glorified in your eventual healing through Christ. Now, the reality is this is hard to believe because you don't see it nine times out of ten anyways. You don't feel it nine times out of ten anyways. But it's still true that God really is redeeming your hurt and using it for something good. Remember we said this passage resembles uh, John 11 with the story where Jesus heals Lazarus. It's one of my favorite stories because you have this you have this two I can't think of a good way to say it. I'm not supposed to say that Jesus has two sides, but there's Jesus is doing two things at one time. And so when uh, Mary and Martha, they call out, Jesus, come save Lazarus before he dies. Jesus hesitates. He waits and doesn't come so that Lazarus dies. And he goes on to say that because God will be glorified in this, this is why I've waited. This is why I've waited. He even says, um, he's talking to the disciples in John 11, and he says, I'm glad for your sake, for the disciples' sake, that this happened so that you may believe. In other words, this suffering is working towards your belief in Christ. And that's true for you. Your suffering is working towards your belief in Christ. It's bringing you closer to Christ, whether you feel it or not right now. Your suffering is bringing you closer to Christ. And Jesus rejoices in that. He is glad in that because what he ultimately wants for you is what's ultimately best for you, and that's to be close to him. Psalm 16 that we sing in uh, the ESV translation of it is, at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. That's where Jesus wants you, at his right hand where there are pleasures forevermore. He wants you close with himself, and suffering may be a way that he accomplishes that, just like it was for Aeneas and Tabitha. But it's also true when Jesus comes, I think it's in Bethany in John 11, when he comes to Mary and Martha and the townspeople who are weeping, they're crying, they're mourning because they've lost Lazarus, their brother. The ESV says Jesus was deeply moved. But that deeply moved, what that means is that Jesus was indignant. Jesus was righteously indignant. He was angry in the sense that he's like, it's not supposed to be this way. They shouldn't have to be suffering like this. Jesus hates that they're suffering like this. He hates that you're suffering like this. And so John eleven eleven is Jesus wept. Why did he weep? Because it's not supposed to be this way. That's why he came to the earth to live and to die himself, to fix this. And you have these two things that are true for Aeneas, Tabitha, Lazarus, and for us, that Jesus 
wants our ultimate good, which may include suffering, because ultimately that's what brings us close to him and to pleasures forevermore at his right hand. And it's also true that Jesus mourns with you through your suffering. It's not that he's cold, indifferent, and distant from you. It's that he's He's with you. Remember from uh, Acts 9, Paul's conversion. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Jesus says. He's identified himself even with your sufferings, that he feels with you and for you, the great high priest who can sympathize with your weaknesses. Those two things are true at the same time. And so you take that and you have this Jesus wants your ultimate good and is working for your ultimate good. And then when that ultimate good for you is hard, Jesus is with you in the hardness. He's with you in the struggle. He feels for you and with you. And then he redeems that hurt that you've experienced for you because you're brought closer to Christ and for others around you, whether you see it or not. So, you know, I don't... <clears throat> You know, Christopher Hitchens, he's a famous, it's part of the new atheist movement. Um, he considered himself an anti-theist, which means like not only did he not believe in God, but he was like trying to get you to not believe in God. He was against God. Um, and I think it was 2010, he was uh, diagnosed with esophageal cancer. And it, I want to say he passed away in 2011, shortly after, from the cancer, but um, right before, sometime before it took his life, he had this cancer, he's suffering through it. And he did an interview. And in the interview, he said this. He said, one of my occasional silly thoughts, first of all, notice that he calls this a silly thought. Just keep that in mind. One of my occasional silly thoughts is, I wish I was suffering in a good cause, a cause larger than myself or larger than just the mere survival. If you're in pain and being tortured and you felt it was helping the liberation of humanity, then you can bear it better, I think. I just feel this is partly random. If Mr. Hitchens were still here, we would tell him, my friend, look at Acts 9. Your silly thought is exactly what God promises. It's right here. The hope that you need in your suffering is right here because God is working this suffering for good for you and for others, for all those who love him. And you are included in all those who love him from Romans 8, 28. God promises your suffering, literally what he says, the liberation of humanity, the liberation of yourself from your sin and the world that's been enslaved to sin. That's what you're a part of, a part of something bigger than yourself. God offers this as a hope that, hey, something good will come out of this. God will redeem your hurt. So don't harden your heart and turn back. Don't intentionally choose meaningless nothingness with no greater purpose than partly random. Don't choose that. Choose the hope that's offered you in Jesus Christ by faith. It is hard to believe that God is redeeming our hurts. But hope against hope. Fight for hope in God's promises. Because he really will keep his promises and he really will redeem your hurt. He really will use it for good. No matter how deep and how dark that hurt has been, Christ will redeem it. And so is the best yet to come. Well, it depends on how you look at it, doesn't it? The reality is, as hard as this may be, <clears throat> in this life, God may call you into suffering. <clears throat> What's to come may not be better in the sense that it's more comfortable for you in this life. <clears throat> Some of you are probably like, Hmm. So that church down the road that you mentioned, what was the name of that church? I think I like Mike their ver I might like their version of the best is yet to come a little better. But even as I say that, that the best not may not be yet to come in this life. That doesn't mean that there's no hope. There's so much hope, brothers and sisters. <clears throat> so much hope. 
hope that God is redeeming your hurt and using it for good. There's hope that Christ can still actually heal you in this life. But there's also ultimate hope that Christ will heal you when you're resurrected into glory. And in that sense, the most true thing in the entire world is that <clears throat> the best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. Ultimately in Christ, <clears throat> pleasures forevermore, eternal, infinite pleasures in the presence of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, experiencing his love and joy, experiencing his life in heaven that he's now brought to earth. That's, that's the best is yet to come. That's the hope that can be yours in Christ. And so come, come to Jesus. Come into his presence with thanksgiving and lay your life down at his feet and say, Lord, Jesus, I am yours and you are mine. Let's pray. Oh, Jesus, out of our sickness and our sorrows and out of all of our hurts, we come to you because we need you. Lord, we need you to fill us with hope. We need you to give us hope and your power to heal. We need you to give us hope and your promise of resurrection life. And Lord, we need you to give us hope that you are redeeming our hurts and using them for something good. Oh Lord, we believe. Come and help our unbelief, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.